All right, welcome everyone to the Zojo Talk podcast. I am Paul Lefevre, the Zojo Developer Evangelist, and I have with me this time Jim Meyer, a Zojo developer. He's been using Zojo for quite a while. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Paul. How are you doing? I am doing great. So let's kick this off by our usual intro. And Jim, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you started using Zojo? Well, back in 2000, I uh, I technically retired from my job. And uh, it seems like yesterday, but it was actually 16 years ago. I know. It's, it's uh, funny like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and um, for since 1984, um I've been a statistician for the University of Michigan football and basketball team. Oh, wow. And um, part of that, at, uh, for basketball, I sit at courtside, and we, as the game's going on, we're pounding away and putting the stats into a, into a system, and they're distributed out to the web. And back then they weren't, but now they are. Uh, and up to the scoreboard and things like that. And the software that we were um, – required to you well i shouldn't say required but that that everybody used uh, across the entire collegiate uh, landscape the ncaa um was horrible uh i just hated the software and so i had some time on my hands and so i decided i'm going to develop a system that i really you know really like um, that does the things that, that i think the job needs um and so i was looking for you know a good tool to to develop it with and somebody had mentioned real basic. And uh, so I got a copy. I think it was 5.5 at that point. I'm not really sure. This is about 2001. And um, I started writing code. Um, I was a procedural programmer. So uh, it was a little (laughs) bit of an eye opener for me to start looking at object uh, oriented programming. But uh, I, I, you know, eventually I got, I got some code out and, um, and an app, and uh, we've been using it at University of Michigan ever since. And I got a couple other schools that use it, but I don't market it uh, real heavily. Um, there is another company that's pretty well entrenched in that whole environment, although uh, their software is not exactly what I'd call state of the art. Um, and you won't believe this, but it actually runs in DOS. Um, uh, so, hey, you're right. I, I find that very hard to believe. Wow. Yeah. Well, they're changing. They're moving uh, to actually they about five, six years ago, they decided to move everything to Flex. And uh, <laughs> which was not exactly the smartest move. But, a, um, so they, they, they're they going from DOS to Adobe's Flex thing. Yeah. Did Adobe like which, drop that or something? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's part of Flash and all that environment. So uh, it's all going away. So I think they're reevaluating that again. But anyway, we use my software at University of Michigan. There's uh, actually my biggest customer is the University of North Carolina, who of course just finished second in the uh, NCAA championship. And, and I've got a couple other schools that use it too. So that was my first project, um, writing that code. And uh, like I say, we still use it. Um, uh, we've used Macs at times. We've used Windows at times. Currently, we're using Windows. It's all touchscreen based. So, uh, you know, you can easily get Windows machines with, with touchscreens all built in and, and ready to go. Um, so that's where we're at right now. Wow, that's pretty neat. So mm-hmm. this is an app that's continuously updated, and you said it was still being used, so it must be. Yeah, the the you know when the rules change, you know the game may you know I may have to change something, but they really haven't. Uh, although this year uh, NCAA women started playing in quarters instead of halves, so uh, the program was always always designed to support that. But I had a few little bugs. I never really tested it, so I had to do another version, but. Um, um, you know, it. I haven't done anything major to it in about five, six years. I mean, it pretty well settled in after the first four or five seasons, and it's pretty, uh, pretty good. Everybody who uses it uh, loves it. But um, you know, if I had a salesman out there pounding the pavement, maybe I could sell more. But um, that's not what I'm interested in doing at this point in my life. So, um, you know, the fewer customers, the better. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, I, I could see how you might think that with something like that. Well, I, I got to say, I know practically nothing about basketball, but I, I would think that that it looks like a very fast-paced game, so certainly keeping track of stats sounds like it would be challenging. The touchscreen seems like it makes a lot of sense because you could maybe be tapping really quickly on stuff. It sounds like that would be almost yeah, the, impossible. Yeah, the, the NCAA and, and NBA or whatever league, you know, they dictate what stats you keep. I mean, you don't keep track of every pass that happens. Um, you know, every touch of the ball, you're not keeping track of that. You're keeping track of the shots and the fouls and the turnovers and the steals and the rebounds. Uh, you know, it's all, all prescribed as to what we have to keep track of, but it can be really fast. Um, you know, you, you get a, a shot with a rebound and another shot and a rebound. And then, you know, there's a foul and, you know, it can get pretty hairy. The toughest thing is the substitutions because you'll have a fast sequence of things you know, like I said, a foul, you know, a, a, several shots, a foul, whatever. And then three players from each team, you know, the whistle blows and three players from each team go on the court. And so you've got, you know, three going on for each team, that's six guys. And then you've got six guys coming off. So you've got 12 substitutions to deal with. And then the referees don't wait for us to be ready. They just go ahead and start the game. And uh, so you've got to be on your toes. The The key thing is, is, um, it really only takes two people, uh, the spotter and uh, an input person. And the spotter's got to be good. Um, and, the, you know, the guy that does most of our games is excellent. He's, he's really good. He's, he's a lawyer. He knows how to talk. Um, and, um, you know, we've been doing it uh, together since 1984. So uh, we, we've got it down pretty good. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like it would need more than one person. I, I, you know, I'm a big baseball guy, and I was yeah. talking with a friend of mine about scorekeeping a baseball game, and he was telling me he recently started using an iPad app to do that. And mm-hmm. he said, it's a little tricky. You know, and he was talking about the same sort of stuff, and he's like, you know, the worst is, you know, when something happens and, you know, you don't, you don't have anyone you can turn to to say, you know, what happened, you know, because you missed something because you, you look down or, or something like that to punch mm-hmm. it in. All of a sudden, something important happened and you're like, oh, no, I'm, yeah. missing, I'm that, missing a stat. That's the downside of the touch screen that, you know, the person operating it actually has to look at the screen. They can't keep their eyes on the court all the time. But we get a shot chart out of this. Um, uh, so, you know, there's actually a, an outline of the court on the screen and you touch the spot on the court where the player took the shot. And so we actually get locations of each player, each shot. Um, so, um, you know, that, that, that's the kind of information coaches want and the, and the kind of information that the, my competitive program or the, the one that everybody uses, that doesn't have that. Uh, that, that program is purely keyboard based. You type codes and players numbers um, to get it to get it to work but that's you know this that's why the spotter really is critical the the other thing we do is is um we have a laptop sitting there on the on the scores table uh that's taking the the television uh broadcast of the game and we're essentially dvring it um and so we can go back and we can look at a sequence if we miss something or if we want to make sure we did it right or something like that so we're recording the game and going back and the other kind of fun part of it is you know we're sitting there at the game by the time the signal goes from the you know from the arena up to the satellites to espn or or you know whatever and then back down to us it's almost an eight to ten second lag yeah, so you you'll know so, if something so, happened. You've got time to look at the screen and watch yeah, it happening. Yeah, so we look at it and and we didn't. Oh, who who tipped that ball or who got that rebound? And then we can look down and about ten seconds later, it's coming in over the over the network. So uh, that works pretty well too. That's kind of how uh, I actually ended up watching the Super Bowl this year. So I, oh, I also don't care much for football, but my wife was uh, correcting uh, papers in the other room, and the TV out there is connected to an antenna. So it had the instant Super Bowl feed, but I was in the living room, you know, reading or doing something else with the football game on the TV on cable. So it had a delay uh, and it was a good five ish second delay. So if she yelled or something out there, then I'd look up from what I was doing and see what happened. And then I could go back. (laughs) What's an antenna? (laughs) What's an antenna? Yeah, I've been trying to get, you know, the complete cutting of the cable cord for television for a while, but uh, haven't. 
my wife likes watching football games, and uh, we can only get, I think, two of the major networks on the antenna. So oh, yeah. it depends who has the game, you know. Because, I mean, the antenna signal's great when you get it. But, I mean, with, with digital, you either get a signal that's great yeah. or you yeah. don't get anything at all. Yeah, occasionally we get that mosaic, you know, with blocks, little squares of different colors. But our, our cable, we we kind of live in out in country a ways, and we got really pretty good service out here, cable service. So can't complain. So anyway, we've gotten really off uh, Sojo, haven't we? <laughs> well, I mean, you're talking about the app you've made with Sojo. Yeah. That's what people yeah. like to hear about. So, yeah. mm-hmm. so uh, what sort of other stuff do you happen to use Zojo for? Well, that's on the hobby side of things. I, I actually have a uh, an app that's sold by a Dutch company, uh, and they sell it worldwide through their distributors. Um, they're in the content management business, mainly uh, newspapers and magazines and some corporate publishers. Uh, in fact, if if you if you get a magazine, you know, on your iPad, you know, you subscribe to like Time or Better Homes and Gardens or whatever, it's there's a very good chance, probably 50%, well, in those cases, 100% chance, but uh, any other magazines, there's probably about a 50% chance that that was developed on this Dutch company software. And uh, they have this large content management system that uh, it's basically Adobe products wrapped around a, a server with a database and, and so on big workflow system. Um, and I wrote a utility, which uh, they sell with their product. It has their name on it. It doesn't have my name on it, uh, but I still own the rights to it. It's called Smart Mover. <laughs> Not the greatest name in the world, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's actually two applications. It's a service application and a GUI application. And it's an automator. Uh, it automates uh, um, jobs or we call them processes. And um, uh, maybe, it, well, each process is made up of a number of tasks. And uh, these are predefined things that it can do. For example, it can FTP, it can do gets, it can do puts, it can send email, it can get email, it can delete files, it can copy files, it can move files, it can do search and replaces, all these different things it can do. And these are all kind of like these tasks are like building blocks and you put them together into a job or a process. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, the service app does all the work. The GUI app is how you manage it, how you set it up and how you can look at logs to see what happened. And it, uh, you know, tracks errors and it will email you if there's an error or things like that. Um, but the biggest thing from the Dutch company standpoint is that it integrates into their content management system. So um, uh, just to give an example, uh, of, this is a, a demo I did at their last uh, users con- worldwide users conference they did in, in Portugal. Um, I had somebody come up to the front of the uh, audience of the session and, and with their iPhone, they took a picture of everybody sitting there. And I had him email it to this specific address I gave him. And so then the, my product is running and it's saying it, it runs this process uh, every minute I had it running it. And it go, went to the email address. It downloaded that photo and the text of the email. It made three different renditions of the photo, three different sizes of the photo. Uh, one of them had put a, a, uh, uh, a, a watermark on it. It uploaded all three of those and the text of the uh, of the email to the Dutch company's content management system, uh, so somebody had access to it. You know, different editors, writers, whatever. Um, it tweeted the content of the email. Uh, it posted the content of the email and the photo on Facebook. And then it also created a a URL in their content management system that when you clicked on it, opened Google Maps, and it showed you exact location where the photo was taken. And then the last thing it did uh, was it sent an email back to the person who had sent the email with the photo and said, thank you for your submission. And it did all this in, you know, about five seconds and uh, all automatically. That's an impressive demo. 
Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, people were, you know, pretty blown away. But most of the people in the audience were dealers and distributors for the product, and they already are familiar with it. Um, so it's it's this utility that that they sell along with their server and their system, and and um, uh, it's it's pretty cool. I'm just kind of hanging on to this, you know, I'm like the tip of the tail of the dog and, and the, the, the tail is wagging back and forth and I'm just hanging on and, you know, the product gets sold worldwide and, um, uh, it's, uh, it's been, it's been great for me. Um, they deal with all the accounting. I don't, uh, they deal with the first level of support. Um, I just, you know, uh, I, I work on it. Oh, probably, 10 to 20 hours a week, you know, some, some periods and months at a time, I won't touch it. Other times I'm working on it, uh, you know, 40, 50 hours a week, um, adding things, uh, mm. upgrading it to base based on changes they've made to their products and stuff. So it is actually something any, you know, well, not anybody, but you know, anybody who has any kind of workflow could use, but I, again, I, they deal with support. They deal with accounting. They deal with all that stuff. I don't have to deal with the customers per se. So it's it's perfect. Right. Yeah. You don't have to directly sell it or anything like that. You just get to no. you know essentially code it, work on it. Yeah. And, so yeah. So it's an automator is, is what it is, and uh, tightly integrated with their product. So uh, that's that's been my uh, you know my more serious uh, Sojo work, um, and it's um, it's Mac Linux. And uh, Windows, the service part of it, uh, uh, and uh, just the Mac and Windows for uh, the manager part of it. So uh, that's that's been a, a you know where I make my living at this point. So. Yeah, well, I, I hear that from a lot of people that you know using Zojo to make those type of apps that interface with a larger, more enterprise type system. Uh, is pretty handy. I mean, because Zojo mm-hmm. can kind of bang that stuff out. It can talk to a lot of different things. You know, mm-hmm. you get all the platforms. So it's a it's a pretty common pattern. The trick is finding the thing to kind of attach yourself to. <laughs> yeah, well, I lucked out in that front. Um, um, a bunch of my former employees uh, started the U.S. Um, distributor for this company, and that's how I got involved with them. And uh, I had retired and, and they started working for this other company and they said, ah, can you help us with this project? And it just kind of, you know, emerged from that. So I, I was in the right place at the right time. So that's been good. Yeah. Well, you know, people make their own opportunities and uh, yeah. that, that worked out. But yeah, you often hear about people that end up with something that's big, that's their primary thing. And like, how'd you get that? Well, you know, right place, right time. I talked to someone or I knew someone. Yeah, Yeah, that's how it's worked out. So, And, uh, you know, on some other fronts, I have an iOS app out there on the App Store. Uh, That one's uh, more of the hobby side. That's for for sailing, for uh, managing... Um, sailing regattas, or, or actually not quite managing isn't the best word, but um, uh, for starting sailing regattas, I'm a competitive sailor and that, so that's been one of my interests. Um, so that was a fun project, learning the new framework and, and, uh, and iOS. Uh, um, a lot of what I like to do is, is learn new stuff, and, and that's what I enjoyed about that. A little frustrating at times, but... Um, you know, going from, you know, having access to the entire file system to being, you know, this all these restrictions and and then, you know, swallowing the new framework at the same time and and uh, and Apple's hoops that they put you through and all that was uh, it took me about six months to to get it all squared away to the point where I actually, uh, you know, had the app out there and and had it working. So uh, so that was that's been fun, too. Yeah, yeah, definitely switching over gears to iOS work is a little bit of a mind shift. I mean, you get the whole app design differences mm-hmm. if you're coming from desktop or, or web even, really. And then, like you said, you know, you got you to work with the newer framework, so you've got some more differences there to process. And then, yeah. of course, Apple's restrictions on what you can access on the device are, you know, 
if you're used to just everything being available on a desktop computer, you start to freak out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, where do I put this? How do I get this? Uh, yeah. It's uh, so it, it was, it was pretty interesting, it, you know, but Hey, you know, you got to learn, you got to move ahead. Um, you know, sandboxing is, you know, if I had to go back and, and, you know, if I was writing the basketball system, I'd be sandboxing that. Uh, you know, I didn't when I, you know, there was no such concept, at least as far as I knew, you know, back yeah. in 2001. So. Yeah, well, Sam, I see, I'm not a big fan of sandboxing on the desktop side. I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense on the mobile side, but on the desktop side, I mean, I can see certain cases where it's helpful, mm-hmm. but man, that just seems. But if you want to sell it through the, through Apple, you've got to do it. You've got to do it. Yeah. Which yeah. is just, it just seems kind of an unnecessary hoop or difficulty they're making for developers to sell through the, their app store. I mean, cause most of, not most, but I mean, I would think several of the apps that Apple itself is selling in the app store. They're not sandboxed. Uh, I'm pretty sure I read that somewhere that they don't sandbox all their stuff cause they don't have to, they, you know, they get the special <laughs> Apple does what Apple wants button that they get to put on their own stuff. And, uh, and you, and you hear all these stories about people that are pulling their apps from the app store just because it's too much of a hassle to deal with that. Yeah, I, uh, I I don't envision doing any Mac OS work uh, for Apple on the App Store. The, that app that App Store, uh, you know, iOS, you're stuck. You, you have no choice. But uh, right, and it kind of started that way, and you know, so it's okay because you know everything works that way. Whereas on the Mac side, you've got. Well, stuff in the app store works that way, but everything else that you've been using forever doesn't work that way. So, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, it's a little bit of extra safety, but not really a whole heck of a lot when the rest of the system is still, you know, unsandboxed, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I can't imagine, I, I work with a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, graphic artists and things and, and, you know, people that are heavy Adobe Photoshop people and in design and, and, you know, those kind of things. Um, and I just can't imagine them being, you know, restricted, um, in that manner. I mean, the organization of their, of their photo archives and, or their, you know, their files and stuff is just critical to their, you know, how they operate. And I just don't know how they'd manage to do that without, uh, uh, without having full access to the, f- the file system. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that would be really tricky. You'd have to constantly be, I guess, prompting people for permission to access paths or something. <laughs> yeah. I don't, you know, I don't know. I, you know, it's not a problem I face day to day, but. Um, yeah. Well, and that's why you often don't see a large, a lot, uh, a lot of large software packages in the Mac app store. Yeah. Because there's just these legacy set up stuff that it's just like, we can't deal with that. I mean, like Microsoft's office stuff is not in the Mac app store. Adobe mm-hmm. stuff isn't. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I, I also playing around with Raspberry Pi now because it's there. <laughs> well, that's a fun one. Yeah. I've been playing around yeah. with Raspberry Pi a lot to myself and that's a. Yeah. I've, I've got a one sitting here and it's, um, you know, we, we travel a fair amount, my, my wife and I, and, and uh, I, I'm always worried about the house. So I've got it emailing me every day with the with the temperature in the house, make sure the furnace hasn't gone out or something, you know, in the middle of the winter. Um, and it, it once a day, it, it emails me for sure, but every hour it checks the temperature in the house. And if it, if it's below, uh, I think I've got it set at 55, it, it sends me an email uh, or once a day just to make sure it's still working. So of course so, the power goes out. The, the, yeah. The, yeah, the, yeah. The, the oh, working. You get your pie and a battery back up. I mean, the pie hardly draws any juice. It could run for quite a while. Yeah, it is on my UPS, but um, so it would it would run a fair amount. But if I know that if I don't get the email, something's wrong. So it's kind of that's why I have it sending me an email once a day, regardless of what the temperature is. What are you using to measure the temperature? Um, I'm using Z-Wave, Z-Wave uh, Home Automation. I. I've been playing with home automation for oh, 15 years or more. I, I started using X10, which is yeah, I've heard of that. It's got its problems. Um, so uh, when I embarked with this, I, Z-Wave is a you know competing technology, I guess. It's a little more sophisticated than X10. And it's actually uh, radio frequency, not it's not piggybacking on the on the 
the wiring in your house like X10 does. And there's a card you can get for the Raspberry Pi that uh, is an X10, or I'm sorry, a Z-Wave uh, transmitter. And uh, so, you know, there's there's an API that come, that you can use with it that I'm dealing with. Uh, it's not quite as smooth as I'd like it to be. I, I tried to convince uh, Bjorn and... Um, and Christian to write a plugin uh, that because they have a C library for it, and I, I'm, I haven't given up yet. But I'd like them to write a plugin to access this uh, Z-Wave card. So how are you accessing it? Well, you can do it through um, HTTP. So the card actually has a you know has a port. And, oh, okay. Um, and so through local host and a port. Like web, simple web service to the built-in yeah. server it has. Yeah. So you can talk to it that way. And that's essentially what I'm doing. So it's really not that that sophisticated. So uh, if it has the C library, is that ship with it as a compiled? Yeah. It's uh, f- it's available from the company that makes the card. It's a German company, actually. Uh, see, after this, I'm going to have you send me links. Cause if okay. It's, <laughs> if it's – if it's, you probably can, we probably can declare into that pretty easily if it's a C library, much like I did for the GPIO stuff. That, oh, okay. Uh, All right. So it's uh, possible that that might be something to add to our GPIO library that's sitting on GitHub. Oh, that would stuff. that would be great. It's that's a little beyond my uh, my my uh, understanding at this point. I'm you know trying to get more into that end of things, but uh, don't seem to ever get the time to sit down and really spend it. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't say I'm any sort of declare expert whatsoever. Although you know, each time I do one, I get a little bit better. But declaring into C libraries, I found is the easiest because I mean, those are you know usually pretty simple data types um mm-hmm. and you know it's really easy to map so so far those have been the easiest for me uh, when you start declaring into things like coco that has much more advanced data types and calling things some i can do pretty well and some i'm um, usually like emailing joe ranieri <laughs> yeah there you go <laughs> great source <laughs> Well, the forum has been great for that. Um, yeah, there's some guys on the forum that are also, yeah, you know, yeah. slick at doing this. And yeah, especially when I got into the iOS stuff, um, um, you know, his name doesn't come to mind right now, but there's been a guy out there that's uh, been just a, a great, great resource uh, uh, for iOS declares. Uh, that was really helpful. The forum's great. I, you know. I visit at least once a day. I'm not, I don't contribute maybe as much as I should, but uh, I guess uh, um, if I feel I can really do it, I, I do a lot of work with soap. And so if something comes up on that front, I try and help people out. Um, but most of the stuff, there's, by the time I get to it, it's already been answered. So, Well, uh, yeah, that's a, there's, a, there's a small contingent of people that are very much on top of posts and often answer things very quickly. And mm-hmm. uh, and then I often ask of them how they are able to do that, but uh, <laughs> from a time yeah. perspective. But uh, but yeah, yeah, the, the forum obviously is a great place to hang out and get uh, Zojo information. And uh, I think there's definitely, like any you know community, there's a lot more lurkers than there are people that post regularly. But yeah, okay. sure. Yeah, what what annoys me sometimes though is when people give bad advice. <laughs> You know, happens, and then, <laughs> and then my my least favorite comment is, "Why would you want to do it that way?" Um, I mean, you know, let people do what they want to do. I mean, they'll learn. Um, you know, it, it's I don't know. Yeah, forums. Yeah, gonna- well, I mean, and the, the one thing with Zojo is we get a wide range of people that use Zojo. I mean, we get oh, no. so we get professional software developers that know, mm-hmm. you know, that have computer science education background. And then we've got people that are just kind of figuring it out as they go along mm-hmm. and everything in between. So, you know, sometimes someone will post and ask a simple question and maybe they'll get an answer that is describing a much more involved advanced technique. And all they want is like the quick and dirty three line hack because they don't care. They're moving on. It's not something that, you know, is you know, enterprise worthy or anyone's depending on, they're maybe just, you know, playing around and figuring stuff out. So sure. it can be a tricky balance answering some of the questions, but yeah. often all those answers end up being in the forum conversation. So you get a rinky dink answer and then you get the complicated ones. All the yeah. Same. Okay. Well, the great thing now that it's been in place for, you know, what, a couple of years, maybe not, well, maybe a year, two years, maybe. I mean, it's really getting to be a great resource for searching. Um, yeah, yeah, the forum will be three years old in June. 
No, okay. It, the searching isn't the greatest, but it's not not too bad. I tend to get, you know, when I'm looking for something, that's the first place I'll look, uh, see if somebody else is running into the same issue. Um, that seems to me to be, uh, you know, it's it's really building. The old the old mail list was was pretty good on that front too for a while, and then that ran its course. Um, but um, I, you know, it may be at some point get a little overbloated, but uh, so far it's great. Appreciate having that. Yeah, I found for searching the form too, uh, doing a Google site search is also a great way to find things. Oh, okay. Sometimes right. the the built in form search is handy, but it doesn't do great um, multiple term matches as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, and sometimes give you rankings that you're like, well, I want all of these terms and those aren't ranked as high. So you end up clicking through a bunch of pages. But if you do a Google yeah. site search, you know, cause Google, you know, obviously they've still got the magic mojo with their searching. And you think they know what they're doing or what? <laughs> <laughs> it seems like they figured something out there. Cause I mean, no one else, I mean, there's other search engines out there, but they haven't really gained any traction by a, a Google searching of everything still remains. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I tried, uh, you know, Jeff, uh, was pushing. Uh, I can't, can't remember the name. Oh, of Oh yeah, yeah, Duck Duck Go. Yeah, he he pushed that, and I, so I tried that for about a month, and I switched back. Sorry, Jeff, if you're listening. <laughs> um, I you know it just it, it first of all it was slower. I mean it was you know I I get impatient sometimes, so you know I mean it was a second slower. I <laughs> should <laughs> but you know it just hesitated a little more, and I, I just I just found it. Um, uh, not quite as, uh, uh, not quite as good. So I switched back to Google and, and, and now I'm, I'm working on a website for, uh, for a group of uh, property owners. And, um, uh, I, I've got to, I'm on the other end of this. Now I got to try and get the website to show up and, in, in hopefully on the first page of Google search. And so I'm learning, you know, I've been reading about uh, SEO and all that stuff. And oh gosh, the evils of SEO. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm. Uh, that's my my current project right now. So that's yeah, be- I've been using Bing a bit more, uh, mostly just because I've been working at Windows a bit more, and it's you know, and I've been using the Microsoft Edge browser, and Bing is of course the default search engine yeah. with the new Edge browser. I imagine I haven't. I imagine I could switch it to Google somewhere. I just haven't even bothered. I said, well, I'll try this. Bing thing sure. and see how it and goes. What do you think? I don't know. It seems to work okay. I mean, I it's hooked up to my Microsoft.com account. And so the only annoying thing is I keep getting these Bing emails for Bing rewards or something like oh, that. No, that are no. like, oh, you know, do this, search for this or do that, and you can earn points to get something else. And I'm like, you know, I haven't unsubscribed from those yet because I, I haven't read up to what it actually is. But uh, that's a little annoying. I don't, you know, yeah. people doesn't email me, you know, with stuff like that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I have a uh, a Windows laptop sitting here. I bought for you know like three hundred bucks. I, you know, because I I was using virtual machines to test my Windows version of my software, and you know, and that's okay and stuff. But I I finally just went out and bought a, you know, a fairly cheap, but you know, it was like under four hundred bucks. It's a Lenovo laptop, and and it. It's shut off as much as possible. <laughs> I mean, I just, you know, every time I start up, well, first of all, uh, uh, who is it? Um, one of the uh, virus protection that comes on it, they keep bugging me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, everything I do, it seems like, you know, everybody keeps, you know, Microsoft or somebody's always in my face every time I try and do something saying, you know, do this, sign up for this. And sometimes you even sign up for things you don't know you're signed up for. It's... Uh, you know, you have to be pretty savvy to, to stay away from that stuff. So, yeah, certainly. Well, I mean, just little things like, you know, I still, I have to run Java on my main Mac because my crash plan backup system uh, runs on top of that. And uh, so the Java runtime needs to be installed. And it seems like it always wants to install something else with that. Uh, I forget mm-hmm. what it is now, but there's like always this little box I got to uncheck that says, no, I don't want that. I yeah. want just the new Java update with the security fixes. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, I, you know, the, the, the environment to me has gotten very polluted, um, which I think is quite sad. I mean, obviously the, the viruses and all that stuff. And, you know, I read a story this morning about the ran- more ransomware. That seems to be the fad now is, yeah, yeah, I've heard uh, some. I, 
I don't have any personal connections to anyone getting hit by that, but I've seen a lot more articles on the internet. Yeah, I mean, you know, some hospitals out west, and now somebody out east got hit, and you know, they, I guess they're they're somewhat smart. They're not asking for you know ten billion dollars. They're asking for like five six hundred bucks, and you know, for a lot of companies and people, that's cheaper than trying to recover all your all your files. It's unfortunately effective. That's really sad. So, yeah, that's the thing. It's unfortunately effective and, you know, reporting it for that little amount isn't helpful and it's uh, people just end up paying it, I guess. And yeah, they're, they're pay you pay in Bitcoin. So there's no, you know, Oh, no traceability. Yeah. You know, it's not like you're sending somebody PayPal, you know, or something where, you know, the FBI can, you know, figure it out. Bitcoin's just, uh, that's the way they do it. So, well, see, the big problem you're running into on your Windows computer is you don't have it on regularly. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you leave it off for a while and then you turn it on, it's going to boot. It'll do its Windows updates checks, and a lot of updates will have accrued. Yeah. And the computer is going to want to do all those things right away. And so then it'll be chugging away in the background trying to do all that stuff. Well, you just wanted to quickly do something in Windows. So then that gives you a bad experience because then Windows is running slower than it otherwise would. Yeah. And, uh, and then, and then if you just do something quick, you might, you know, power the thing down before it even finish the updates. So the next time you turn on more are going to accrue. And so I found often, you know, just to, you know, leave windows open, which I always have windows open, but I have it in a VM. Yeah, you're yeah. probably right. I should probably uh, do that way. We, we ran into that, you know, going back to the basketball, we, the computers we use for doing the basketball games, we, you know, we've put them away now for the year, the season's over and we won't pull them out till next fall. Yeah. You get so to pull them out a couple out. weeks ahead of time. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we pull them out and fire them up and, and hook them up to the internet and just leave them there for, for about a week and let it all, I mean, boy, at that point, when it, when it has to update the, um, Oh, what is it? Um, there's some libraries that it just takes forever. Um, and uh, so we, you know, we plan well ahead of time. And um, that that's very important to do. <laughs> well, last week, uh, or maybe it was the week before, Microsoft had their build conference and they ended up announcing a new insider build, you know, essentially like their betas, I guess, or something like that. And one of the big features of this insider build was that it was going to add some of uh, a Linux command shell, Bash, the Bash Linux oh, command yeah. shell. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And I said, I wonder if, you know, just for the heck of it, if Zojo's Linux apps will run on Windows in this Bash shell. I said, that would be a really cool thing to test. So I'm, last week, so it was over a week ago, I have an insider VM, of course. I fire the thing up, you know, go to Windows Update. It doesn't recognize this new insider build. Can't find it, can't find it. So there's no updates, no updates. You know, I'm Googling around trying to find answers to this question. Apparently, this is not an uncommon problem. The most common answer was wait. <laughs> wait how okay. long? And the answer was days. So you had to wait days for Windows to recognize that there was an insider build. And I guess they were phasing it out. It's not like there was a bug yeah, necessarily okay. in Windows. They were just phasing it out slowly. So I, I waited all last week. It didn't show up. Uh, over the, the weekend, uh, it still hadn't showed up. I think I, I ended up, I was just about to throw in the towel. And then on Monday, so after the weekend, I came in and I uh, saw a couple posts in the forum that were somewhat related to this topic. And I said, all right, try it one more time. I go in, hit the button. Oh, it found it. So it took it took six days <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> before it found the, once it found the update, it installed very quickly. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, and then I ran that, and then I, I jumped through the hoops to enable this Linux support, and then I built the Zojo Linux app, and it didn't run. And I'm like, oh, that's too bad. But then I said, hmm. So I built it again as a 64-bit Linux app, and it ran. Mm. Oh. Yeah, and, uh, and it ran. Uh, it had to be a console app, of course. It's, uh, there's no GUI or anything. This is yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Microsoft. But it's just it's really strange that Microsoft has added the ability to run native Linux console apps from a shell. I still have to play with that some more and see if it's possible from within Zojo to call into this shell and then run essentially a Linux script <laughs> when you're running on Linux, on Windows, which might be kind of cool for Zojo users because then you wouldn't need to have the separate script for the regular Windows command shell because often OS X and Linux can use the same commands. Yeah, yeah. 
No, that's pretty cool. I, I saw when uh, a headline that Microsoft was doing that, and I thought, you got to be kidding me. I mean, what a change in uh, philosophy from the, from the previous regime, I guess. Uh, maybe they've taken on a new approach with a new leadership. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of 64-bit, um, hopefully we're going to see uh, 64-bit um, Sojo script here soon. Um, because I need it badly. <laughs> I need it very badly if I can use this opportunity to, 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 uh, plug that, that feature. Um, because my, uh, this, the, the smart mover product is, uh, I, I, it, the service is, is, I, they have a Linux version, but, and I badly need 64 bit, but it also uses Sojo script. And uh, uh, so I can't build 64 bit and I got people pounding on me because it's getting harder and harder to get uh, Linux installations with 60 with 32 bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, def- yeah. Some of the new distributions aren't even shipping with a 30. Yeah. Bit. And the, and a lot of uh, the customers uh, are using um, Amazon web services um, for that's their that they're spinning up a Linux box on Amazon, and that's what they're using. And there, you know, there's limits to what they'll do there, uh, what you can get from Amazon. And right. 64-bit is is all of them are 64-bit. You you can't you can't install your own libraries on some of these. And uh, yeah, they're all pre-configured, kind yeah. of just you know pre-built boxes that you set up and then you run stuff on. You don't monkey with. Yeah, so um, I'm getting getting some heat on that front so well it's not like i can announce anything during the podcast i mean obviously yeah. we need that as well i mean uh, zojo itself relies on that and in order to get the 64-bit version of the ide uh we're going to need that in place and okay good i'm so, glad to know that the the dog has to use his own dog food. yeah so we will we'll need it and uh, uh i know it's uh okay i'm it's hoping- on a list here somewhere so i yeah, I, I should be all set. Other than that, I mean, I'm I'm ready to go or at least to try it. The debugger would also be nice, of course. I would think they're probably coming about the same time as my guess, but not putting yeah. any pressure on it. I think you can guess that there is some relation there. Yeah. 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 So um, I, I'm really hoping that that happens really really soon because uh, I need it. So along with about a dozen other things <laughs> are on my list, but we won't go into that. No. Yeah. Well, you know, like you see on the forum, everyone has their favorite dozen things that uh, yeah. they want in Zojo. And you know, we're happy that people, you know, love to use Zojo so much that they want us to add all this stuff to it. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I, that's great. Uh, we're working away on them. I, and certainly I'll do my, my plug a little earlier than usual, but you know, for people like that head on out to uh, Houston, Texas in October to the Zojo <sighs> developer conference. Well, I, I'm not real happy with Dana or whoever made – the fall is really a horrible time for me. Uh, <laughs> I might not make that. Uh, oh, no. You've been there so many years in a row. Yeah. Um, I, I think I've only missed one or two of, since, they've been, uh, since they've been around. And um, I, there's a very good chance. I haven't been able – I haven't signed up, so I've already lost my $200 uh, early bird discount. Um, but, um, you know, I mentioned the basketball. I also work at the home football games for the University of Michigan. And, um, it, and that really makes my fall difficult. I can't miss those the football games. And um, so the, the weekend, well, the week before that, we actually have it on the road. But that's the few weeks we have to travel to other places. So, uh, and we usually do a major trip somewhere in the world every year. So... I may be stuck not going this year, unfortunately. So, Bummer. Yeah, yeah. This is our yeah. first one that's in the fall, which, yeah. you know, like any time we pick is great for yeah. some people and bad for others. And, yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. And, uh, um, but yeah. we'll see how, I mean, the fall goes. I mean, so far, attendance, uh, registration attendance is ahead of schedule. I think we're all oh, half booked already. So, uh, okay. and we got a lot of people that were like, you really need to try one in the fall, see how that goes. And yeah, well, I understand it. You, you can't, you can't suit everybody. So yeah, I don't expect you to schedule around my schedule. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we try to schedule around every individual person's yeah, schedule, okay. but that, that often comes untenable. 
Yeah. <laughs> so as I'm looking, you know, we're doing the, the podcast, maybe audio, of course, but, you know, I generally mm-hmm. talk to guests via video. And as I see behind you on your little bookcase there, you've got mm-hmm. what appears to be a collection of antique computers. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there's a Mac SE back there that actually works. There's an old lampshade-style iMac that works. There's a clamshell, orange clamshell uh, iBook back there. And they made those in orange? Yeah. Uh, you know, they originally came out in blue. This, uh, you know, and then, yeah, there's an orange one back there. And um, and then sitting on the floor, there's an old, uh, you know, I don't know, what do you call it, the bubble gum machine uh, blue Oh, the original I, iMac. Yeah, the original. Yeah. This one, actually, I'm sorry, it's purple. Um, so it wasn't the first, you know, at first they just came out with the one kind of bluish green, I think it was, or something. This one's actually, when they, in the second incarnation, they had like four colors or something like that. And that one's actually, it's a touch screen. It's the, it's the machine. We, I sent it to a company and they, they applied a touch screen to it. And that was the first machine we used to do the basketball scoring. Oh, okay. Um, so it's kind of a uh, sentimental value for that. Yeah, yeah. It's actually owned by the university, but it's sitting here in my house. Oh, <laughs> yeah. hopefully they're not listening. They, they would have. They would send back me. that computer. Its value is four dollars and eighty-five cents. Yeah, I'm, I think it's got a negative value because they'd have to scrap it, and it would cost them money to do that. So <laughs> I don't think they miss it at all. Um, nobody said anything to me. And then I, I do have some other ones that aren't, aren't visible in your video. Um, you know, um, there's a G4 power book sitting that's running, uh, some other home automation stuff. Um, that thing just, the battery's dead, but you know, I have it plugged into the wall, so it's fine. Um, that one's running my caller ID application. So, it, it announces over the whole house audio system uh, the caller ID information, and that's that's another Sojo app I wrote. Uh, it it listens in. It's got an old dial-up modem on it, and um, it listens for the caller ID information, and then it looks up the phone number in my contacts, and it says the person's name out the speaker, which is then connected to the whole house audio system. So when the phone rings, and it hasn't rung here while we've been doing this, but when it rings, it'll, <laughs> it'll say, you know, Joe Schmo is calling. And uh, that's probably the, the one home automation thing that my wife really likes. She, she doesn't like the rest of it because lights sometimes go on and off without anybody touching. <laughs> <laughs> it's the appearance of a haunted house. <laughs> yes, and, and when she's here alone, it really freaks her out. Um, but uh, that one she really likes, you know, that we know whether it's somebody we want to answer the phone or not. Uh, I see. I have a general rule that is, is I don't want to answer the phone. So yeah. my my home automation for phones is to turn off all the ringers. There you go. That's, and then that's if, uh, if someone wants to talk to me, they'll call and leave a message and then I'll get an email. <laughs> oh, okay. That's that's a that's a way to do it. Screen out those calls too. Yeah. Yeah. Screen all, all the calls. I just all the calls. If they really yeah. want me, they'll text me first, and uh, that'll work better. Yeah. Well, that's that's the way the world's going. That's for sure. I mean, I still have a landline. I'm I'm archaic, but we yeah. live in an area where cell phone reception is still pretty bad. It's gotten better, but it's still pretty bad. And so I just I can't go to a cell phone. It's it just doesn't work very well. So. Yeah, I've been phasing out our landline over the years, and I just recently got it to the last step before phasing it out. Is is it is now running a magic jack? Oh, you, yeah, you've heard mm-hmm. of those things. It's a little, it's a little gadget that's plugged directly into yep. my cable modem, and then I got a wire that's plugged into the phone outlets, and then all the jacks in the house. Now you plug it in, it goes through this magic jack gadget, which is, you know, it's dirt cheap. It's something like forty bucks yeah. a year. And uh, the sound quality is not great, um, but who cares? I don't talk on the mm-hmm. phone. It's mostly there, you know, just so that we've re- maintained our, our home phone number we've had for the last 25 years. And uh, But I think it's going to get phased out. My original plan was to maybe use Google Voice to just keep the phone number and then have that forward to ourselves. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't port a landline number into Google Voice. Oh, Okay. 
So um, I'm, I'm hoping I can eventually get the landline number ported to a cell and then get that cell pointed to Google. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One way or another. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I, I use Skype heavily, uh, mainly, you know, with international, uh, with the international business that I do, Skype is great. Um, and then I have a Skype phone number that, you know, I kind of make like my business number. Um, and so I, I find Skype pretty good, even, even though Microsoft now owns them, <laughs> um, it hasn't, it's, the service is still pretty good. Um, uh, they had a few releases that were less than uh, ideal, but it's still a pretty good app. So. Pretty neat. So. All right. Well, yeah. it's probably time to start thinking about wrapping this up. So sure. yeah. I want to thank you, Jim, for being on this episode of Zojo Talk. Always a pleasure. My pleasure. And I do hope that you will be able to fit in XTC into your fall schedule. But if not, uh, we'll, uh, we'll send you a pen. I, okay. Oh, wow. Great. <laughs> well, I, I still want to try. Uh, it's just we've got to work out some other things. And once we do that, then I'll know for sure uh, whether I can get there or not. All right. Great. Well, thank you again. Well, thank you. And have a great day, everyone. <laughs>